Hello. Hello. Hi. Happy Friday. Yes. I think it's Friday. Mm -hmm. I hope so. If not, then we're in trouble. I don't know what to do. <laughs> if it's not, I'm going home anyway. So <laughs> oh, seriously. <laughs> Oh, it's good to see all of you. I know that some of us just jumped from the working group lead meeting over to here and without, you know, a chance to get a glass of water or look in the mirror, anything like that. Um, but it's nice to see all of you. And I see Sarah shaking her head at me. Hi, Sarah. Um, I like your hair. Uh, Hi, I miss you. I miss you. Um, so, Kelly, what is, what's happening today and what are we talking about? Um, I'm sure we'll probably get some more people joining us as we move on. Um, cool. But let's, let's get to it. Cool. Um, so, Dr. Fisher mm -hmm. and Ed Jamison are here and they're going to talk to us a little bit about getting buy-in from staff. This was, um, this is a, I mean, a pretty hot topic, I think, everywhere, but especially our tier two shelters. Um, a, a lot of them had mentioned that this, that, that hearing about how to, how to do this um, would be really helpful. So um, I am going to go alphabetically and start with Ed. Would you mind telling us how you do, how you get staff buy-in, if you have any tips, tricks, strategies? I talk really, really loud. No, um, I actually, I, we change all the time. So first change isn't as scary because we're always trying to improve. We're always trying to figure out what's the next step. So it's finding that wheelhouse of the initial when you're dealing with change. Um, but buy-in from the staff, bringing them in so that they can understand the why, you know, all of us and pretty much everybody on this call, we're usually pretty high up at you know our planning and and all of that and we might have been talking about something for two months before we try to put it in action well your staff doesn't have all of that background as to all of the work and all of the the hurdles that you ironed out um almost all the time things that we didn't communicate well that we were going to do when they, they start screaming about it as soon as i would say we're doing it because of x y and z then they're like oh okay. And it's like, all right, why don't you just say that on the front end so that they understand, hey, we're trying to euthanize less dogs with heartworm. So we're trying to develop a heartworm program. Um, you know, we're trying to respond quicker to calls in the field and we're trying to find ways to more effectively get there. If they have that on the front end, usually the pushback is just so much less because they actually actually under, understand the why. Um, and it's not in many of our job descriptions, but I have tried and luckily I'm still young enough, although I'm kind of getting to that threshold. But like when I came to Dallas, the first things that I did is I spent days riding around with officers out in the field, going on their calls. I spent days cleaning kennels. I spent days um, shadowing the medical team so that they could see that I wasn't just making stuff up for my office and that I at least had their perspective. And something really simple and stupid I learned cleaning cages was the broom handles that they had didn't even fit properly. So it was physically impossible to get the certain areas inside the cages. And I was like, why didn't you say anything? Like we weren't allowed to ask for stuff before. So I bought them better brooms with shorter handles. And you don't have to have a huge budget for, for like some of the things that you see when you put yourself in their shoes. And it, it just buys you a bunch of street cred that you're, you're willing to do that. And I, usually I'm wearing a tie and all that. I, I wore jeans and, you know, yellow boots and the whole nine yards, um, you know, that it showed one, you're willing to put your money where your mouth is and you could actually see the hurdles that, that they were saying. So um, staff doesn't agree with me all of the time, but they usually don't push back as hard because they, they know why we're trying to do something and um, we were on a call earlier, I just saw Jordana pop on here, it's something we had said too, it's we wanna make things so perfect. We usually tell them that we're piloting something, we're prepared to make mistakes, we know it's not gonna be right. We need to see the mistakes early on before it's a big blown, you know, full-fledged project. And it makes it way easier because we all know 
staff, when they're reluctant to do something, they're waiting for a mistake to happen so they can point it out to you. Um, but if you put that expectation on the front end that there's going to be mistakes and this is why we're going to do this and we're going to roll it out in phases and we want your feedback so we can try to iron these out as we go down that path as opposed to saying, here's the finished product. Let's run at 100 miles per hour. Start at 20 miles per hour and start building up your speed. So it's been pretty successful. I did that okay in Cleveland, not as good as I had hoped. So I really tried to make sure that those things I just said I did when I got to Dallas. And now we change all the time. And it's not scary to them because they're a part of it. They're a part of the discussions. And they know what we're doing today is likely not going to be what we're doing two months from now. There's going to be, you know, um, adjustments. Hopefully that helps or makes sense. Yeah, that is super helpful. Um, so maybe I'm, I'm curious to know, like, what was a time when you had a really hard time, like, getting buy-in and, and like, like, like a case, case story, if that makes sense. Case story, January 15th, 2018. So I had been in Dallas. I started on October 17th. Microplasma. Dogs were showing up dead in the morning, and it was microplasma is what the test was. So your dog totally fine, out in the play yard the day before, come in the morning, dead. It was, it was horrible. So the initial reaction was, let's clean out, and we've got 15 big rooms or whatever. Let's clean out 10 of those rooms, <laughs> keep the dogs that we think are healthy, and I'm like, no, no, that, that's, that's not how we're going to deal with this is by mass, you know, calling them. But that was just, that's what they did. Hey, take the ones we think are healthy. Um, and it was like, no, we're going to change the way on this. So we're taking that off the table. And the idea is, we get it. We might not save all these dogs. We have to identify what the hell it is. And we want to try to stop this or treat it or whatever, because we, did, we didn't know what it was. Other than dogs were waking up with this, or not waking up. We were coming in in the morning, and this super fast-acting pneumonia was coming in. Um, and I'm not a vet. I don't pretend to be. I don't even play one in my weekend job. But I, my understanding is microplasma is only one component of it. It's something attaching to microplasma. And there, it's not a test for something that you don't know. And so we changed the way we went about that. Hey, the answer is not just to, to thin out everything to get our arms around it. Um, all, so we instead we went into we're going to keep these animals in each of these rooms together while we try to figure this out. And then went through a bunch of stuff. And I brought the, the vets in to be a part of the discussion to test it. And they, they, they were the, the biggest ones in the past that that was the way that you would deal with some type of an outbreak on something is to thin things out. And it's like, no, that's gonna be a change here. Death isn't the first option. It, it might very well end up being one of the options, whether they you know, pass on their own or we have to make that choice due to the population coming in. But to change that type and now almost every decision, like life-saving decisions now, their first answer was death. Now the answer is life, and let's see, and sometimes we come up short or the medicine doesn't work or the program doesn't work. Faith was there when we were dealing with distemper, the same type of thing. You used to be kill it all to get it out so that the new ones don't get it. And it was like, no, we're not gonna go that route. And Faith knows we still put down the dogs that were positive when our isolation room was full. You know, So there was still some of that that came in, but that wasn't the answer. The answer was that let's get better protocols and change the way we're processing these animals and moving them through the building. And the buy-in, when they saw that it worked, it, you know, that, that's the extra cherry on top when the stuff that you try, you know, actually, actually works. That's so awesome. Thanks, do you guys have any questions for Ed? I know some of you guys are from the tier two shelters. Do you have any, um, any particular staff buy-in um, issues, we can troubleshoot. Think about this, I, just because I saw Chris on the call here and he's, he's contacting me with some questions on stuff. Um, field RTOs was a, was a new buy-in. Dallas, it's hot and heavy with dogs running in Dallas and we were literally charged to stop the loose dog crisis in Dallas. So the answer was round them up and they, our staffing was hired based on a study of how many loose dogs and getting them in that mindset, why do they have to come to the shelter? Well, because dogs in Texas have to be fixed or in Dallas have to be fixed. Okay, well, we've got these fix-it tickets, which is a voucher to get the animal fixed. Okay, next, why, why does it have to come in the shelter? And we just kept finding answers and now return to owner and field. We, we, not during COVID, but we secure dogs all day, every day. The first time I ever met Josh, he was yelling at me about why you guys catch so many dogs. Um, 
It's because that, that's Dallas, but we don't bring all those dogs into the shelter. We have vigorous on finding their owners. And that really, really took a change of, they were used to bringing them in. How many did they unload halfway through their shift? Did they fill up their truck halfway through the shift is how they were judged before. And now we judge them on how many do they get home. And I still have a bunch of those old school officers and they're all good with it now. Ed, I have a quick question. How did you address the excuse of, um, or the reasoning is we don't have enough time to be doing, uh, you know, reuniting in the field? Is it because you're judging success on how many they are reuniting and not bringing in? It was that- No, I, I acknowledge that it does take longer for them, for the officer, it actually, it takes significantly longer. Now you've got to do an RTO on field after you actually find that owner. So I acknowledge it. I did set resources for it. Um, we had officers that, because they do, they have a big long list of calls every day, all day long, and they can't sit there and work on one dog all day. It's not going to happen. So we, we acknowledge that it was there because that was the first thing they said. How are we going to do this other stuff you judge us on, responding to our calls timely and all of this? So I had to have an answer. So there are people that actually will come and pick the dog up off of their truck and then stay in that neighborhood, and there's a whole set of protocols that they'll do. We don't always have resources. So I know it's easy to say the answer is we threw a resource at it, but it starts with acknowledging and then they're right. It does take longer. Let's find ways that we can do that. So they're expected to spend X amount of time on that dog, make a call um, if they know they're gonna have to move off. And then the, the RTO officer picks up the dog off the truck and stays in that neighborhood and works it as long as they can. And they also saw that it actually saves them time on the back end. <laughs> They're not having to unload that back at the shelter. So yes, it takes a while to um, get it back in the field. You're still going to have to clean that truck. You're still going to have to do whatever, but you're not going to have to do all of that work you do at the shelter um, when you come in and you can relate that time. Okay, maybe it takes you eight minutes at the shelter. It might take you 15 in the field, but neutralizing that out, we just got you seven minutes there now and we got a better result and you actually saved the department days worth of work and actually got a better result because it's back the dog's back with his owner yeah ed uh thanks for calling me out on this one um i'm actually i'm actually supposed to be presenting on you know radical return to owners next week so it's timely um but but my whole team whole team that sounds weird there's five of them um they uh they don't all have a buy-in on, on what we're doing. Um, you know, I, today I had to deal with a, a, a supervisor coming to me to say that we had a situation where um, it was it was a return in the field, or we followed the dog home, but um, but the officer gave like a threat of future punishment as opposed to. You know, this is the third time we've been here. You know, how do we how do we make sure this doesn't happen? I mean, it, you know, to me, it's a simple, nuanced conversation, and, and I'm still, you know, people are asking me, how, you know, how are we doing this? But I mean, we still have challenges like like um, like others are, are having, and uh, and we're also getting pushback on things like so with field services on. Um, you know, at what point does can we issue tickets? At, at what point can we can we do what we are hired to do? So, so you know, I still have some folks that have this um, traditional reactive punitive mentality, even though we're touting uh, all of the supportive work that we're trying to do. Yeah. And then we also have um, you, some of you are probably uh, have unionized workforces too. So we're getting pushback from folks that are saying it's not my job description to do support work now that's on my field services team that's my shelter team that they don't you know they're giving pushback on like the case management approach and on you know filling out forms and handing out supplies to pet owners yeah and it, every community is different again and things were bad in dallas and literally people were getting mauled in the street and you had to carry up uh, um golf club or a baseball bat to the mailbox if you lived in Southern Dallas, because there was a good chance you were going to get accosted by dogs. So there was a much heavier approach on the front end of that to, to address the problem. And even where we're at today with all of the social unrest and, you know, it, it is what it is. It's no secret in this industry. I'm, I'm the only black person on this call. Um, you know, I, some of the, I'll say punitive, even though we have all these fix a ticket and there's a lot of stuff to try to, uh, 
apply equity, we're trying to say, how can we still get the same effect without ha being as hard? And believe it or not, with the fix a ticket and the, when the officer does his, their job, it actually explains the whole thing. And hey, look, you can schedule an appointment. They'll come and pick up your animal. They'll fix them. These citations will all get dismissed and all of that. Usually they were getting a thank you at the end of that anyway um, here in Dallas. But I am trying to think when we come out of Dallas that I briefed council on January, January 15th of this year and they wanted a citation with results thing and they were applauding the number of citations and the number that were dismissed with compliance. But again, as, as a black man, I don't want my officers to write 25 or 22,000 citations next year, even though the vast majority were dismissed with compliance, but I still need to get all these dogs fixed and microchips in them and the things that Dallas has said is important to them. So we're trying to come up with creative ways of still getting that without it. At least we have a carrot with our stick but I'm trying to get the stick all the way out of there is what I'm, you know, what I'm ultimately trying to get to. Unions coming from Cleveland, I feel your pain. And I've been on both sides as a union president and as the chief there who had the, to work against it. And all depending on the state and what the contracts and, and all of that stuff, it, it's hard pressed to see simply trying to get an animal back to his owner, that that's not somewhere in one of those other duties listed um, even on the case management and service, and you're, you're a smart guy, so it's a matter of the wording and then what kind of relationship with the union, then the best thing is, is that when it's like, fine, I'm going to hire or get volunteers to do this work. If you're saying it's flat out not written in the union scope of work, then I'm going to get somebody else to do it. And nothing is motivating more than when they realize that they might get pushed out because of it. Um, again, I just said you don't like using a, a a stick and you don't use a stick on your employees either. But again, when you're talking unions, there sometimes are a lot of sticks that come, come back out. You know, you want to try to work. We're just trying to help people. I, same thing. My Cleveland officers didn't want to drive owned pets to our offsite surgery location. They did not think that was theirs. Our job is stray animals. One, I went to the officers who didn't care about that and had buy-in, you know, and it's like, are right, you going to file a grievance on your, you know, fellow officer? Um, and we kind of got around from that way and then put the ones who wanted to be out doing calls, tried to just assign them that way. When you're dealing with five people, your options are only, you know, only so far on that, but try to have them doing what they want to do. And then you can push them out. When I brought in volunteers in Cleveland, that really woke up my shelter crew big time. These volunteers will do this stuff for free that you're saying that you, it's not in your job description to do fine volunteer will do it. And then I just have to might might have to write a job description that fits what they're doing and it might push your job out. That's a really good point. Um, I guess, do you guys have any other questions? I have a question for yeah. folks on the call. Like how many people have unions uh, that they're dealing with? And Where are you Josh, at, Kathy? I missed the question, I'm sorry. Oh, no, you're good. Uh, Kathy, um, yes. I wanted to know where you were. Yeah, uh, so I'm in Brampton, Ontario, Canada, Ed. Oh, okay. And I don't... Uh, just to the north of Chris, and Chris and I are new best friends. <laughs> <laughs> so we've been chatting quite a bit, but um, I love that idea of saying, you know, volunteers uh, could do that stuff because that's one of the challenges we've often had in utilizing volunteers is we can't get them to do union work. So, you know, people want to come in and clean the kennels and do these things and work with the animals and basically all we've got for them in the past is walking dogs and playing with cats but that kind of stuff is going to be pretty awesome and you know I will just share I think one of the main reasons why we're talking about this stuff on the call is because of the um, verbal breakdown I had one Friday afternoon and so that was close to the end of June and I put it out there to staff I had an all staff meeting I said you know this is what we're looking at we get to pick and choose what we want to do in this program and when we want to do it and we're already doing a lot of things that are part of the elements of the HOSP program so you know I want you guys to give some thought to the elements and I want you to let me know what are your top three in order of preference um, and we're going to set up internal working groups. Um, out of about 35 staff members I had two people reply to that request so I just put it out there again yesterday and we're going to send out a survey monkey survey 
and I told them flat out in the call yesterday, you know, we got hardly any response. And so I'm putting it out there again. There's, it's coming with a deadline this time and whoever doesn't volunteer will be voluntold and you might not like what you get to do. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, I did it with, they didn't have, they didn't have adoptions in Cleveland before I got there. Um, everything was transfer. Um, and so that was one, the volunteers did the adoptions. Um, and then eventually I was able to write in a receptionist type position and I hired a volunteer for that for the first, so that, that got their attention. They didn't want to do play groups. Um, they, that's not our job, a clean in the cage. Fine. I'll do that. You know, but I, this is not in. So did started play groups with volunteers and then ultimately wrote in, um, canine enrichment personnel is what we called them. It, uh, started with granted positions, um, Petco Foundation, if I'm not mistaken, did that first grant for that. And then the city ended up picking it up. But that, that started to open their eyes that this guy's not playing. This is going to get done one way or another. And you start writing those positions and you write enough overlapping into the description that, okay, now they are allowed to do part of your thing. And you've become a little less in, I don't want to say important, but you, you know what I'm getting yeah. at is you, yeah. you can certainly push them the direction. It's always best when they just cooperate or at least are willing to have a discussion. I mean, that, that's, that's the best, but people naturally want to go back to what they used to do. That's just human nature. Um, until you can get them comfortable with being outside of their norm. Well, I have a few key staff members who are really keen about this stuff and I'm hoping that that will help add some peer pressure, but yeah. um, you know, Ed, uh, if you'd like to circulate any of those volunteer position job descriptions you've got um, from Cleveland, <laughs> I'm yeah, sure we'd all be happy that. to have a look at them, right, Chris? <laughs> yeah. yeah, definitely. Let me see what I can, what oh, I can find from the Cleveland days. Awesome. And Josh, you're operating a little bit of a different model, which is in line with some of the other orgs that are, that are on here. Um, how has it been going at your organization with staff buy-in and what does that look like? Um, so we've been largely successful with staff buy-in. Um, our management team, of course, is, you know, 110% in. Um, they, you know, they're just awesome. I can't say enough good things about them, truly. Um, the the frontline staff, as, as it kind of trickles down, we've got some who are great with it, and we've got some who have taken a little bit more time to come around. Um, I think Ed hit the nail on the head when he said, um, you know, essentially there's just a culture of change in this industry that has to be present in order to be successful in a lot of ways. And um, we've definitely created that here. If we make it through a full week without me throwing some random idea at the wall and being like, who's going to take this on? Um, then people are excited and, and a little bit terrified for what the next week will bring because it means that I've got a list. So uh, I think that's part of it. I also strongly recommend um, that you hire a couple and you have the husband run your field operations and the wife run your uh, placement side of the operation, because then if they bring anything to in that's not supposed to, they've got to hear about it here. They've got to hear about it on the ride home. They've got to hear about it at home. It just really makes life so much easier from a field ops perspective. <laughs> um, so that's, that's definitely a you know, real way to streamline things right there. Um, no, but we are, we are very fortunate that we've got a, a pretty good amount of buy-in from our team internally. Uh, citywide, we tend to go unnoticed in a lot of ways. Um, so we are very good at begging forgiveness rather than asking permission. Um, I, you know, I think I probably ask them twice a month that you know if they'd like to fire me they're welcome to but you know we're not going to stop moving forward just because i'm not getting a response to an email um i actually got chewed out i had to jump off of our last call uh that we were on rory because i was getting chewed out by someone in the city that for something they didn't like because they weren't cc'd on an email so you know <laughs> it is what it is at this point um but it, it's very, so I think that thinking outside the box is, is key and, and creating that culture, like Ed said, of, um, of constant change is important. 
And I can think of a very recent example. So we've been hugely successful with the number of dogs in our care um, going down because we're able to get so many into foster here lately. Like the bulk of our population is out in foster, not physically in the building. And we, so because of that, uh, we have made all of the animals in our building available for public view. So even while they're on their legal stray holds, they're available for public view, interaction, everything else. We've had a couple bites occur um, in, not because of that, but because of a couple other things. And so our field op staff in particular got very in their feelings about us placing animals that historically we wouldn't have placed. And there was a lot of conversation around, have we gone too far? You know, are we, are we focusing too much on the numbers and not on, um, you know, actually putting, actually doing what we're doing responsibly, right? Um, so the, the mindset from our field ops staff in a lot of ways was that we were putting potentially dangerous dogs in particular back out in the community. And we combated that mindset by essentially just pulling them all in and they had to rotate through doing rounds for a week. So the start of their shift, we would we rescheduled our shelter rounds and we did scheduled shelter rounds at the start of all the different shifts and they had to participate in those for a week. And by the end of it, their 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 heads were kind of spinning because they were like, wait, you you have to know all of these things about every single one of these animals in these in this building and you have a plan for them by day one. And then if it's not executed by the time they're legally ours, then it totally, it gets reassessed. Um, so that kind of just sent them all for a loop and they've been far more supportive since then. And it also opened their eyes on the importance of their, their side of, of the story, right? So, you know, whereas they would kind of half-ass their narratives in a lot of ways coming in from the field, we've gotten far more thorough narratives from our officers about what they're seeing in the field. Um, and we actually had an officer email a template today that he has asked if we'll put into our computer system so that they can use to start um, providing some behavior notes of what they're seeing in the field. But, they, but he did it in such a way that they're being mindful of the situation as well, right? So if they're having to go after a stray dog and catch a stray dog on a porch and they've got it cornered, it's going to act very differently. Have a good weekend. Um, then if, you know, it just comes up to you and you hand it a cheese biscuit, right? Um, those are two extremely different situations. And so being mindful of the behaviors and the context for the behaviors, because a lot of times when they just put in there, you know, was able to get dog on control stick, dog tried to turn and bite, bit control stick, you know, but they don't put that they had chased it for 20 minutes and finally cornered it on somebody's back porch. You know, that's a totally different, um, it's a totally different ball of wax, right? Like, and, and the situation where the animal that had that experience and bit the control stick and everything else came into the shelter. And then it's, you know, a happy, friendly dog. And we're like, all right, we're putting it up for adoption. Well, the officer doesn't remember that that was the sixth black pit bull that they picked up that day. And, you know, they're just rereading those notes seven days later. And they're like, this dog tried to eat me and you're trying to put it out in the community. Well, yeah, but it go, go take it out of the kennel and take it for a walk. It's a great dog. You know, what did you do to it for it to try to eat you? <laughs> So um, I think that it's, it's a holistic view. And as much as we can give that holistic view to all of our frontline staff, I think there's a benefit to that, right? Because I am super guilty of, I operate at 30,000 feet. I am generally speaking, have no idea what's going on in the building on any specific day because I'm too busy thinking about what next week, next month, and five years from now is going to look like. Um, so I think as much as we can, bringing that kind of total view down to the front level so they understand the logic behind and the, the path that we've kind of charted for all this stuff makes it much easier for them to wrap their heads around and get on board with. Josh, that's such a great point too. And like your facility does come into play in Cleveland. It was such a horrible building. Animals were going to do horrible from being picked up in the field in one of those situations you said and of course the officer notes down 
got blood from biting the pole and all this and that. And then it's a super hyped up, crazy scenario, that, that old building that I operated out of in Cleveland. Um, but one of the things in Dallas is we make it very much where they can see everything. So depending on your, your shelter software and how your process is, they can look in and see the medical that was done. Um, they can look in and see play group assessments and, and things like that to be a part of that, as opposed to remembering this is the dog I put in that cage three days ago that was a monster getting in. Now, it's super important to get that for liability and dangerous and vicious dogs and all of that stuff. That's not saying to doctor that in, in any way, shape, or form, but that is just that, that one piece of it. And it's really shifted in our place from where officers are now going to check on dogs to make sure that they got adopted or we do pre-adopts, which most things are already pre-adopted on their first or second day there, as opposed to that checking up to make sure that that crazy Josh Fisher isn't trying to adopt this dog out. It's like the other way around now where they're like, oh my gosh, where's the dog that I brought in yesterday that was in here? Oh, he's already getting surgery because he's leaving today. Or we found his owner and he's going home this afternoon. It's crazy when that shift happens that they they're looking for the positive outcome as opposed to the not positive outcome and a lot of that just goes with that change if they're used to that they're not used to these animals getting out um you know having a positive outcome that's a change for them in their mind they have to rectify that in their mind that that's a shift that is is the way it is now more of these are going to get out than not get out and it wasn't always that way absolutely and I think it's interesting you mentioned the building structure, right? Because um, that has some that is something that here our building is twenty nine and a half years old, almost thirty years old. And when you walk through it, you can tell it was built in a catch and kill mindset. You know, you bring them in, you hold them for maybe seventy two hours, and they go. Um, I was reminiscing with some staff this morning, and they were talking about how you know if a cat came in that maybe kind of sort of looked at them funny, it was euthanized right away as being a wild animal. Um, and that was only 10 years ago here. So it's crazy, right? And I think that a lot of times, especially when you have staff that has been around for a while, especially in just one agency, right? They haven't moved between agencies, but they've stayed in one place. You tend to get stuck in this mindset of, oh, well, if we only had a better facility if we only had a newer facility so at some point you've got to just make it um you've got to make it so that those excuses are no longer acceptable right like we can't blame what we're doing on our facility you know we've had we've had architects come in and design a new facility and give us you know all that stuff and been and started down that road and then they gave our our council a number and it came out to be 87 million dollars and our council said yeah you're lost your damn mind we're not giving you 87 million dollars for shit so you know we're gonna be here for the foreseeable future because 87 million dollars isn't on the table um so you know it's that kind of thing that we have to be mindful of and, and then you just have to draw a line in the sand and say you know this can't be used as an excuse anymore so stop saying it and god help the person that looks at me and says but we've always done it this way because I will literally just lose my shit right then and there. Like it'll, the exorcist will happen. My head will spin around. It'll be a whole thing. <laughs> that is amazing, um, Veronica. Um, do you want to talk to us about what you wrote in the chat? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Kelly. I'm still good <laughs> She's like, <it>, Josh. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> yeah, I wrote it in the chat so I didn't have to talk. <laughs> yeah. No, it's okay. Um, yeah, so being a foster program coordinator, um, I am not, I'm not a director, I'm not a manager um, at the shelter. Um, I've been here for a couple of years now and I feel like we have really grown, um, grown the program um, on, you know, the adult side and all that. Um, but uh, I, I and the neonatal kitten coordinator, we are the coordinators for the shelter uh, and take care of all the foster. So with uh, COVID, on set, you know, uh, we sent right at the beginning, I think we sent it was like 95 or 97% of our animals out. Um, and now we're trying to maintain a steady 75%. Uh, and we're doing so uh, very strongly at the moment. It's very exciting. We're able to pull from a lot of transfer partners. Um, I would say 
the biggest obstacle was people adapting to change and then also uh, being willing to kind of throw their hands in and help with um, areas that they didn't previously have to help in in the shelter or you know same with volunteers bringing on more volunteers to help remotely so yeah uh, those that were flexible have been the most resilient those uh, who have a harder time with change you, you can definitely tell that it's, it's taken its toll on them. You said something I meant to bring up. And again, I was on a call with Jordana earlier today too, um, that I said, one of the things that's beautiful about the HOSP program for, for me, what are there 39 working groups or is it 41 now or whatever the hell it is, it's a lot. Ed Jamison's only on one. Um, and I did that on purpose. I, and I'm, I love being in everybody's business. Josh knows me well. I'm good at being in your business and I'm really good at micromanaging, but I'm more successful in Dallas because I don't micromanage. I trust the team. And with Haas, we're able to really spread out throughout our entire team. It's not just me and my assistant director and my general manager. Um, we have leaders that are not in, I'm going to say leadership positions like you said, Veronica, but you are a leader. And that, that is the best way to affect change is to have those people that are doing the work that are your go-to pe people that you know will get your buy-in, have them go and do it. You know, explain it to them, tell them what you're trying to do, and then Veronica just goes and does it. People are going to get on or get off the bus at, at that point. They're going to have to decide. That's way better than Ed saying it, you know, or his assistant director saying it, is the people who actually do it. Um, so... I, I love that you did say you have become a leader because you are. There's tons of leaders in our in our agencies, whether you've got 220 people like I do or you a uh, five person shop. There's leaders all the way through that. And you've got to start treating those people as leaders and letting them be a part of the change as opposed then it's not again just the top to it's not just Josh, because Josh has always come up with something new. It's actually, we let our people come up with ideas and have t times where they get to pitch new ideas to us. And we're like, crap, let's go ahead and pilot it. Why not? You know, you guys think it would be easier on this process to go A, then D, and then back to B? Do you think that that, act sure, let's give it a shot and see, see how it goes. And th that's huge for buy-in when, when the people doing the work come up with it and you give them the ability to go and make it happen. Absolutely. And I think that creating that culture where it's okay to, to try it and, and you don't have to go through a million and six layers of approval to give something a shot and to change something is imperative, right? And I mean, our staff changes stuff all the time. And then I go back there and start doing it the old way. And they're like, oh, we don't, we don't do it that way anymore. Please stop touching things. Um, and I smile and nod and walk away usually because I'm like, mm, okay, my bad, sorry. Um, and it's, you know, that's got to be, that's, you know, this is changing too fast for, like Ed said, for us to micromanage every little thing, right? Like, I don't have the bandwidth. I don't remember what I ate for breakfast this morning. I mean, I was putting out 16 different fires because there were people upset about not being CC'd on a damn email. We got folks in the feelings. I mean, it's craziness. So, having staff that that take that initiative and move through those processes and lead from the front lines is imperative and then also being creating a culture in which it's okay to have something that doesn't work out and you know other people look at you and being like i told you so and it not getting you know not causing you to absolutely fall apart right so just just being fluid and being flexible and try it because I, I tell people in this organization all the time, I can fix anything but dead. The only thing I can't fix is dead. And so go on with your bad self. Make it happen. <laughs> it, 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 so um, I've got people who've worked for Dallas Animal Services for over 20 years. They've seen, been through all kinds of hell. It's, for, for reference, I've been there three years. My predecessor was there for six years. And in the last dozen years, there were 11 directors do the math that that's a lot of freaking change <laughs> that that they have seen dallas animal services used to be closed every monday that was called cleaning day that was cleaning out cages day so that they could start over it's cleaning out the animals in the cages day to start over for the intake it was every monday shut down 
volunteers, staff, everything would kiss dogs goodbye on Sunday because they knew they weren't going to see them on Tuesday when they opened back up. So my staff that's seen all of that stuff, once we started blue, since I always said that they had a cap on them, it was like a pot. They just kept it down. Once we opened it up, they were actually able to like grow and do things. And yes, you've got to learn from mistakes and some mistakes are worse than other mistakes, but don't tell them that they're allowed to make decisions and then crack them for making a decision. Talk to them about why it was, you would have done a different decision. Find out why. What was your decision tree on why you decided to do this? And then you can talk through that. And usually they'll go, oh, man, I should have gone right at that point instead of left, and it would have got a different outcome. Um, but you, you got to let them make mistakes. And we get it. There's legal things in our industry that are on. So those mistakes are big. Giving the wrong dog away or an owned animal away or something like that, that yeah, that, that's a tough one. Josh is right. You can't fix dead. So obviously the wrong animal being put down is those are mistakes you just can't have, but um, simple process and how somebody trying to do something better. Don't, don't blast them for trying to make those decisions, you know, get, give them the ability to, to let them grow. And it's amazing what, to do, what they'll do. I honestly feel most of my team would run into a brick wall right now. If I told them we really needed to get it done. Don't look at me like I'm crazy, but most of them will, a couple will, click me off and say, no, I'm not doing that. Um, but most of them will do just about any of these things that we're trying to change because they know that it's, it's all with good intentions. And when you get to that point, it's pretty good that your staff is going to fight for your decisions. It helps with all the craziness we have to deal with outside of our building and throughout our communities. Anyone else have any questions? I'm I'm sort of curious about something that I've been um, reading a lot about in terms of just like redesigning service, which is like the idea that we want to keep operations moving and not interrupt sort of like the core services while we're growing and changing. Um, and I'm wondering sort of if like how that plays into staff buy-in in terms of like, are there certain people who are the change makers within your organization and they, or the influencers and they've been sort of tasked with driving this piece while there are these other folks that maybe have a harder time with change and you know what I mean? Like, is that something that you all are seeing and utilizing sort of like two people's strengths? Absolutely. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I said my, my old schoolers in Cleveland, I, it was easier to not have them try to transport own pets to the spay neuter surgery. It was just easier. And my progressive officers that were all about helping people and love getting a thank you. I went, I went that way. It was easier. I, if I was still in Cleveland at some point, Jose Lopez was going to have to transport dogs. Um, it was just a done deal and I was going to have to tackle that, but it was much easier to have Bobby Nolan do it because he liked doing that kind of stuff. Um, again, and then you start, then all of a sudden Tim Holzer is like, well, crap, Bobby's doing it. Shit, it's actually easier transporting these own dogs <laughs> than going out on these calls on the mean streets of Cleveland to whatever. And they were lining, it was lining up that way that they realized the good stuff of doing those different types of changes. And a lot has to do with your resources. I get it. It's not easy. And things are different now with COVID and the hiring freeze that we're under in Dallas. I have a lot more, I would say, my chessboard's bigger than most. So I have more pieces to move around and, and play with. Granted, we've got, you know, comparatively, you know, more things happening, but there's more pieces to play around with. Cleveland didn't have that. It was a much smaller staff. And so it was, it was a lot harder with those pieces. Um, but what we do a lot while we're figuring out in Dallas is we do actually, we do time studies all the time. Jordan Craig, if you know her, she's the queen of assigning time studies to everything that's done. Um, and then you actually have some validation to stuff. You, you validate that work that that person is doing really is, man, they're actually getting eight hours of work done in 10 hours or 10 hours of work done in eight hours every single day. Or you actually find tons of efficiencies that they're not doing. You know, you, you, you went on 10 cigarette breaks. All right, that, that, that's the problem. You're complaining about how busy you are, but you've got 10 breaks that you've worked in there for yourself um, every day. But yeah, it's a lot easier when you can find that champion, um, which every eight animal agency has those rock stars that are whatever their role is. 
And I'm, I'm sure everybody's heard it. Oh, you always, you're, you always favor Josh. You always give Josh. Well, one, Josh always says yes and is always willing to try and do something and then challenge that person. Well, I absolutely have you do. I'm not going to give it to you to have you, know, have you be lackluster in it. But if you want to do it, absolutely. And you can use that. We do competitions all the time. I came in and they were literally, and this, again, this is how Josh met me. There, there was quotas from the BCG study. An animal control officer in Dallas should um, impound X number of dogs a day. We've got the numbers here. It's like, shit, let me combat that with return to owner and field um, um, challenges. You know, and it's cookies or little made stupid um, badge things that, that we do that they're kind of spoof things, but everybody wanted to wear the badge. We have a big screen TV in the field office that the officer of the week's picture goes up on. And that's not on favorites. This is a measurable thing. Go ahead and be the number one at this this week, and your picture will be up there all, all week for for everybody to see. Um, just get creative with it. That helps break them out of their their norm, um, and you'll be amazed once they're – people know what they know. And so sometimes you have to show them something new to be able to replace that. And um, once you start breaking up that monotony, it will become your – It'll become your norm that things are going to change all the time, but that that does take a little bit of time, and you have to be willing to put in it, and and your staff that watches people and find a constructive way so they're just not always getting written up for not doing it, but saying no, remember we changed that, we're doing it this way now. Um, it'll become norm if you're able to stay consistent with it. I'm a firm believer in you know that good southern mothering way of doing things. You know, I'm not mad, I'm disappointed. It's, um, you know, so that's, <laughs> I guilt so people uh, into stuff all the time. I clean cages so much in Cleveland because they would be complaining about it or I'd be running play groups because they were complaining about it. I'm like, screw it. And I had this white police type uniform I wore. I'd be out there, I'd be cleaning cages in that. And then there, some are like, look at that stupid chief doing it. And then some are like, crap, we, we should be doing this right now. The chief's actually doing it. No yeah. problem guilting people into stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. No, I mean, I get yelled at all the time because I go get a mop and mop up. I'm like, I'm sorry, guys, I'm not an invalid. Like, yes, I am in dress clothes, but I, I still do know how to mop. That is, you know, my mother did raise me right. I, I can use a mop. I know where it is. I know how it goes. I don't use dirty mop water. <laughs> I made that mistake one time. You don't, you don't do it twice. But it's, I think it's creating a culture where nobody is above doing anything, right? And we had, because when I first got here, we had a lot of that. Our officers were like, well, I'm not, you know, it's not my responsibility to take the dog out to the kennel after I've brought it off my truck. You know, the, the medical staff who are processing it into the system are going to do that. Okay, well, but you don't have anything else to do. You're here 30 minutes before your shift ends take the leash and walk it down the hallway, jackass. Excuse my language. I'm very crass. I apologize. <laughs> That's why we get along so well, Josh. Um, well, I've, I keep seeing children popping in and out and I'm like, oh <laughs> no. Um, yeah, sorry guys. <laughs> so, but that's, I think, important too is, you know, realizing that, um, and our field ops manager actually put it really well the other day in that uh, our staff are starting to see the value in cross-training and making themselves more valuable in a variety of different areas because they have found that if they can make their, themselves valuable in multiple areas, we're more likely to give them the, the more preferred assignments. Um, whereas if they are just so stuck in one thing, they kind of pigeonhole themselves and they get shoved off to the night shift where I don't need you to be able to interface with the community in our, in the same capacity. You know, you, you can go deal with the barking complaints kind of thing. Um, so it's, there's, there's value in getting to know an organization, you know, nose to tail kind of thing and make sure that you can add value wherever possible. Oh, I'm glad the children can't hear me. That's that makes me feel better. Well, if it makes you feel better, my daughter is a little used to my potty mouth. So <laughs> I was raised by you know a father in the army and a mother in the navy, so I don't. Yeah, mm -mm. I use swear words like commas. 
My daughter's father is a Navy man, so yes. <laughs> There's something to be said for cussing like a sailor. <laughs> Hey folks, this is uh, Shelly Simmons and I'm um, with the Tier 1 shelter in uh, Greenville, South Carolina. And I'm just going to add that, you know, I think I found that really all it takes is one person um, within a department who, um, who, who, who has the buy-in um, to get other people to buy in. And I think a great example of that for us um, has been the way that we are handling getting pets home. Um, and there's this whole new revolution of, of, of looking at things differently that, that, you know, lost animals do not have to come into the shelter. And that was really hard to get buy-in from our staff. And I think we're still, still getting some buy-in from some staff. But when they start, to, when when you find when you find that one person who's willing to give it a go, and try it out, and they are successful at it, and they share their success story, it just starts to snowball. And um, you know, we've seen that happen so many. Where you know, we're you know, of course, we're a tier one shelter, so we're implementing as many different programs and and elements as we can as quick as possible. And and, um, and, and, but, but, you know, don't, don't feel like you have to get the entire staff buy-in. You really only need a couple of people and it starts with one and it starts with one really great program that kicks off and people see, huh, this is going to make my job easier, <laughs> you know, or maybe not easier, but it's going to make my job more meaningful and I'm going to leave at the end of the day feeling better about what I do. And, um, and I think that that's what we've been seeing here in Greenville. Have any of you guys read the tipping point? I think it was the tipping point where they talked about this whole, this phenomenon when there's where, where you find that certain person who kind of like helps to kind of, you know, light the fire under people. And I think that that's, you know, pretty, that's really important in a lot of things. For sure. And it's often the person who, when they're not motivated, makes everybody kind of crabby, right? But when they are motivated, can be that champion. Yeah, we all have the toxic people and it, that just absolutely brings, brings everything down. There's just as much to be much to be said for that positive person that can can pull everybody up. For sure, this has been great. Thank you so much, Josh and Ed. Um, it's this has been really fantastic to have you both here. Um, Anytime. Well, I've got everybody on. HSUS wants me to take fifty more dogs. Who's got some room? She said a bunch of medium to big size pit bull, mostly heartworm positive. Who wants to help? Who wants to help us out here? Coming from Louisiana, I just took eight Ridgebacks and a Dane and some t terrier things, and I think I've got fifty cats on the way next week. I'm good, thank you. <laughs> yeah, we the Beaumont totally dogs or animals were all headed back home, and then we just got told we're taking people and pets from Louisiana that are actually, you know. Um, state sponsored coming coming up and then amy just messaged a little bit ago so poor poor jordan my general manager is like i think we made it through this thing and i'm like yeah we don't take all 50 but i, I want to probably take like 25 more or so she's like are you kidding me <laughs> is what it is but there's no paranoid if you were on the friday call the the talk was that nancy was talking about disease and all that and we already have things set up but now the team is all you know they're they're all worried about that um, is what it is. <laughs> I think Kathy said she'll day. take you some if you can get them up to Canada. Well, I, I didn't get a chance to finish that pit bulls are illegal here in Ontario, so I can't take those. <laughs> we can call them uh, boxer mixes. Yeah. Josh um, didn't just get eight Ridgebacks. There's no way in hell there's not eight Ridgebacks <laughs> in North Carolina. So come on. Do you have any idea how many boxer lab crosses there are, are already in Brampton, Josh? <laughs> No, but I'm sure that it would be a very interesting number. <laughs> All 
Amazing. We have Ridgebacks here, Ed. Not eight of them all at once. No, you don't. We did. We they actually were purebred Ridgebacks. They came from a puppy mill. I want pictures. I'm not buying what they, you're selling. They probably came from like a hoarding case, and there's yeah. something wrong with all of them. <laughs> they did. There were. Um, I think we took in four of them that were seven months old, had been born in the shelter that they came from, and had never left their kennels. So they didn't know how to walk, you know, outside of a kennel. It was really fun to carry a 70 pound, seven month old puppy down a hallway. It was awesome. <laughs> Awful. Poor dogs. They were really sweet though. They've actually all been adopted already. <laughs> cool. That's amazing. Kelly, what's our topic next week? Um, we are talking about evictions and intake. Um, and Christian's going to be here um, to talk about that. Awesome. Well, thanks everyone so much. Thank you guys so much. Thanks, Dr. Josh. And thanks, Ed. Really appreciate yep. it. Have a great Bye, weekend, everybody. Have a good weekend. Bye, guys. Bye.